Welcome to Hebrew Gospel Pearls. We're no longer in the pilot episodes. We've done one and we've done two. We've done public. We've done plus. But now we're beyond the pilot episodes. Nahemia Gordon and I have decided we're going to jump all the way in the Hebrew Gospel Pearls. So here we go right now. Matthew chapter two is where we're going to start. I don't know where we're going to stop. Buckle your seatbelts and let's get started. <laughs> Nahemia, where are we at? I feel like we're still in the pilot period. What? We got to, you know, like a pilot period for me is like 10 episodes, but, but whatever, Let, let's move forward. <laughs> Listen, folks, if we're still in the pilot period, <laughs> yeah, you would not believe I'm going to, I'm going to say something. I'm going to start this off. I'm going to tell people, yeah. Nehemia, you have really, really, really raised the bar in terms of what we're hoping for Hebrew gospel pearls. I think I've gotten on last count, seven boxes from you from Amazon, trying to create a better uh, level of, of production. We've had, I don't know how many people have touched Hebrew gospel pearls from my end, three or four, from your end, six or seven. People are really excited about this. So don't tell me we're yeah. not in the pilot episodes. We're we're beyond the pilot episodes. This is, we're completely know, invested so right, in this. The first episode, I forgot to hit record <laughs> no, that's and true. we had to use your backup recording. Yeah. And now we're, uh, we've got the, the, the black sheets behind us. We did the second we're episode. To get, they, they, we're, they, they, we're, this, this first episode, Second yeah. episode, and before we do this, I want to. We're going to graduate to green screen soon. We're going to graduate uh, to green if, screen, if but the I technology wanna, is available. I want to stop and say a thank you. Uh, I want to yeah. say thank you uh, to Michael Rood. He did something that was really, really special, and that was he invited us in to the Shabbat 2020 uh, presentation and gave us hours. <laughs> But he gave us one really good section where we could do yeah. the Hebrew Gospel of Matthew, what I'm calling a launch, and uh, mm -hmm. it was it was perfect. Nehemiah, you did a beautiful job. You were yeah. uh, you were uh, wherever you were in Texas. I was in the studio with Michael, and I think it was the best hour in terms of presenting what this is about that I've ever heard. So that's now available. Uh, <laughs> people can watch that. It's going to be at bfainternational.com, nehemiahswall.com. YouTube and everywhere else. I just wanted to say thank you to Michael because that really made me feel yeah. like we're beyond the pilot episodes also. This is Look, episode. he's the one who came to me in the first place with the question that then led to exactly. me looking at different manuscripts and exactly. finding, oh, there's a Hebrew version of the Gospel of Matthew. Yeah, yeah. Right? So, so, going so back I definitely to him, want to give him credit. I just thought it was really cool. 18 years later, he mm -hmm. did a beautiful job. Their production yeah. team did a beautiful job. It's a great presentation. Yeah. Please watch that if you don't have any idea what we're talking about. But we're in Matthew chapter 2 and we're going to make it halfway through Let's let's read verse. Well, hopefully, we'll make it halfway through the chapter because so so Hebrew Matthew divides this actually into three sections. Right. Uh, in other words, the chapters we have were established by Stephen Langton, the Archbishop of Canterbury, in the early 13th century. Mm -hmm. This is a known thing. Mm -hmm. uh, the chapters that are divisions that are found in in the Hebrew version of Matthew are different chapters. Mm -hmm. So, for example, what he calls uh, we're going to call it sections, right? But really, he uses right. the word parak, which is chapter. Yeah. So chapter three mm -hmm. is um, of in Hebrew Matthew is really chapter two, verses one through um, let's see one through twelve. Right. And where it gets a little bit um, uh, controversial is chapter four of Hebrew Matthew is the Greek Matthew chapter two, verses thirteen to fifteen. So it's only three verses. So he said, "What we're going to do a whole episode on three verses." Yeah. We could do it. I know we could, but uh, let's see how far we get, and we'll divide. But the Hemia, before we get started, I want to. I, I really sections. need, and I want to make sure this doesn't get touched by anybody. I don't yeah. want anybody to edit out what I'm about to say. This is really important. Clip, um, clip, clip. We are on the uh, third, if I can say, episode of Hebrew Gospel Pearls, and there has been some confusion, probably not from your end, but from our end, where people are saying, "Well, wait a minute." I, 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 what, what's this bait and switch? When a person actually said to me that we were doing smoke and mirrors by starting out uh, the first episode and then going over to plus. Well, through some communication, they realized, oh, I'm really sorry. You never said anything other than you were going to do it. But first they charged me, not you, Nehemiah, that I was kind of like not being upfront. So I want to be really upfront. Here's what's upfront. You came with, I think, an amazing idea and it's working. I want to tell you, thank you. And the idea was simple. Keith, we're going to spend hours and hours and, and dollars and, and time putting together Hebrew gospel pearls. So let's make two versions available. Stop me if I'm wrong. The first version would be our public version that we're going to let everyone listen to and let them determine 
if they want to go further, if they want to go deeper, and specifically, if they want to be a part of really the fuel, which is our support team with NahemiasWall.com or our premium folks with BFA International.com, they're the fuel that allows us to do all this other stuff. So there was some confusion that somehow we were just going to go on and on and on. And people actually said, well, why do I have to become a support team member? Or why do I have to become a premium member? Because without these people, nothing happens. <laughs> right. Look, I mean, uh, you know, one woman wrote to me and she was actually upset. She said, I already support your ministry. Why do I have to support BFA international.com? Right. And I wrote back and I said, well, look, this, this is a, it, it's a collaboration of two different ministries. I'm sharing what I can on my website. Keith's sharing what he can on his website. And, uh, you know, if each one of us went by ourselves to do this, it would be a completely different dynamic. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I people have said for years that you and I have a synergy, right? The definition of synergy is the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Yeah. And and I think there's something to that. And um, look, you don't have to subscribe to either one. You don't have to you support really don't. my ministry or, or subscribe to the premium content. There's so much material here that's going to be like 100 hours Can I, can hours I, can I make sure material. that I say this really clearly? I want to yeah. say this really clearly, Nehemi, if I'm not clear. One thing I always loved about you all of these years yeah. is you'll always go behind me and fix stuff, which I've needed. <laughs> but I want to say this really clearly. I really believe that what we're doing right now is very unique. Jew and Gentile coming together, not just in idea and philosophy, in practicality. The ministry that you have, the ministry that we have, we are literally tied together in this thing. So each episode, folks, if you don't understand it, you're going to get what you're going to get right now. Click it, watch it, YouTube, Facebook, wherever you are, and I hope you'll enjoy it. And I promise you right now, you're going to get a lot just from what we're about to do. But if you want more, you go to Hebrew Gospel Pearls Plus. One week it's at NehemiasWall.com. One week it's at BFAInternational.com. And that's where we provide everything that we can get out. And probably, I don't know how, how long we'll do it, but it, it's really giving people a chance to go even further. And that's not for everybody. So please, folks, don't think that this is anything other than the straight, clear message. There are two versions. The public version. Well, it, it, and the, it says there's two versions. Well, there's Hebrew Gospel ver Pearls. Yeah. And there's a more in-depth study, which we call Hebrew Gospel Pearls I, Plus. You see how That's basically me and you continu continuing to teach for another hour or whatever. <laughs> it could be 15 minutes. I don't yeah. know what it is. Yeah. It depends on how we're led. Yeah. But, you know, it's interesting. I actually get sometimes the opposite criticism from people within my ministry. They say, look, we're trying to put out content as a thank you to the people who actually support the ministry financially mm -hmm. um, and in other ways. And, and, and you're giving everything away on the podcast for free. <laughs> and I'm like, look, <laughs> if I'm convicted to teach these things, I, I just can't hold it in. I, I mean, and, and I want to, I want to jump right in Keith. Go, let's go. You right know, it's it. really, it's really interesting. We, we laid out in the first episode, how we're going to be using four kinds of different sources. And one of them is a book written by my cousin in around 1878, 1879, Rabbi Elijah Tzvi Soloveitchik. Yes. And, and he goes at length to discuss a topic that isn't entirely obvious. Mm -hmm. um, if you look in the book, the book's called The Bible, the Talmud, and the New Testament. Originally, it was called Kol Kore, mm -hmm. uh, 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 the voice calling out in the wilderness. And it's the first ever Jewish commentary by someone who didn't convert to Christianity, mm -hmm. This, in this case, by an ultra-Orthodox rabbi um, on the New Testament. And it starts off in the days of King Hordos, which is Herod, when Yeshua was born in Beit Lechem of Yehuda. Magi came from the land of the east in Yerushalayim. And then he goes on for a number of pages talking about something which has nothing whatsoever to do with Herod. It's funny. And I think we have to talk about that. Well, do he we goes, have to I'm talk about here. that? Because here's the thing. Yeah. I, I mean, I, folks, if, if you didn't get, I mean, they probably don't have the book. I mean, if you do have the book, it, yeah. it really is quite fast. You get it on Amazon. But did you see that as a connection? Um, I think this is his introduction to the book. That's what right. I thought. In other words, so, and, and look, in a way it's important because he's trying to say, okay, what are my sources as this ultra-Orthodox rabbi in the 19th century? What am I using to understand the life of Yeshua? Mm -hmm. And he's from the outset telling you um, that, and he actually, what he's doing is dredging up a, 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 a debate that goes back to the 13th century. In the 13th century, um, let, let, let me read you a little bit of what he says here in the beginning. This is in the Bible, the Talmud, and the New Testament. And it's on page uh, 73, chapter 2. Mm -hmm. He says, honored reader. This, remember, this is an ultra-Orthodox Jew in the 19th century. And, and, and there's a statement at the end which is so profound that I think a lot of people missed it. 
Honored reader, this ancient baseless hatred has been glowing in the hearts of our Christian brothers against our Jewish brothers for over 1,800 years. Mm -hmm. They, the Christians, said that our fathers struck down their Messiah for no wrong that he committed, and that we must suffer for the wickedness of our fathers, and they seek his blood from our hands. And it's interesting, I've, I've, I've expressed this to people, this a very similar idea, and they said, oh, the Inquisition, that was 500 years ago. Uh, ever hear of the Holocaust? Um, here he says, until now their fury has not been appeased, as we saw with the events in Romania. And I was curious, what events is he talking about in Romania? And I looked up in, in the history books and I saw there are so many events in Romania of Gentiles attacking Jews, Christians specifically attacking Jews, that I don't even know which event he's talking about. Mm -hmm. um, a modern reader would assume he's talking about the Kishinev mass massacre, um, which was the great pogrom of 1904, I believe it was. Uh, it was on Easter 1904 that the Gentiles, the Christians, went out and started attacking Jews because they were upset that the Jews killed Jesus, right? It mm -hmm. was Easter, right? And they were, had just commemorated the death of, of Jesus, and now was the time to take vengeance on the Jews. That, that's the way they saw it. Um, that was actually a pivotal event in Jewish history, the Kishinev Massacre of 1904. Um, Bialik wrote the poem, Il Haharigah, the city of, of slaughter, and it sent Jews flooding out of Eastern Europe Many went to the land of Israel. My ancestor, um, who I'm, uh, my middle name, and I'm named after Shalom Gordon, he left uh, Eastern Europe after those massacres or during the time of those massacres to get away, came to uh, the United States. Um, so what he's talking about isn't something from ancient history. It's something that's still happening today. It happens today in France. Be honest with you, it happens in New York. All right, they go, he goes on, they deem it a mitzvah. I love how he's using these, these Jewish terms, right? I mean, the Christians, as he understands it, deem it a mitzvah to seek vengeance for his blood, for Jesus' blood, from the hands of their Jewish brothers. And again, most of the people listening to this program, I understand they don't see it this way, but there are people, there are Christians in the world today who see it this way. Uh, and certainly in history there were. He says, even among our Jewish brothers, uh, who lack understanding and who oppose that Yeshua of Nazareth is the cause of the evil that happens to them. Some accuse their Christian brothers and their Messiah, and the fire of the controversy continues to grow. Therefore, I saw it as incumbent upon myself to show everyone that it was not the hand of the Jews that put him to death, and I will show that both our Jewish and Christian brothers are mistaken in their understanding of this. And what's interesting, at the I want to jump to the end of this, and, and we can talk about this. Yeah. He's asking the question, did the Jews kill Jesus? And really, as an ultra-Orthodox rabbi, he has to wrestle with the question that the Talmud says that there was a man named Yeshua of Nazareth that the rabbis executed mm -hmm. on the eve of Passover. Mm -hmm. um, that's the issue he's, he's, he's struggling with here. Here, this, this is now page 78. This is the end of this, this five-page or so excursus on the question of right. who is the Jesus of the Talmud? That's really the question. Mm -hmm. right? He starts off saying that they hate us because we killed Jesus. And we didn't even do it. And they misunderstood what's in the Talmud. He says, therefore, it is incumbent upon anyone who loves truth and peace, especially those who teach and lead the many, to inform their Christian brothers that they are mistaken in this matter. It is incumbent upon them to eradicate, uproot their baseless hatred that is concealed in their hearts towards their Jewish brothers. So who is he talking to here? I think he's talking to a Jewish audience who says, look, you got to tell the Christians we didn't kill Jesus. And the Jesus of the Talmud is another man from Nazareth. Look, last week we talked about how Joseph was both the husband of Mary and the father of Mary. That was two Different weeks Joseph. ago. That was two weeks ago. <laughs> right. Okay. Well, in the last episode, we talked about how Joseph, there was a man named Joseph who was the father of Mary and another man named Joseph who was the husband of Mary. <laughs> and what he says here is there was more than one na man named Yeshua. Right. Um, in fact, there was more than one man from Nazareth named Yeshua. Right. Now, it's interesting. Recently, we had this whole controversy about five or 10 years ago. I remember I was at your house when we watched the documentary on the History Channel, um, and it was about how they found the tomb of Jesus, and there were bones in it. And what was the claim? There was a tomb in Talpiot, and in the tomb, there was a, a, an ossuary, which is a bone box. And on the bone box, it said, Yeshua, the son of Joseph. And they said, Yeshua, the son of Joseph, see, that's Jesus of the New Testament, Jesus right. of Nazareth. Except um, there's a second tomb uh, where they, also in the Jerusalem area, <laughs> where they found the same exact name, obviously from a different person because it's a different tomb. Right. Um, one of the arguments of these people who claim that those were the bones of Jesus was that 
something like every fourth person was named ja Yeshua. Um, they actually brought that up themselves. That it was such a common name. So the argument that that he brings here, uh, this uh, uh, Elijah three Soloveitchik, is that the uh, Jesus of the New Test, I'm oh, sorry, the Jesus of the New Testament is not the same as the Jesus of the Talmud. That there were two different people named Yeshua of Nazareth of Nazareth, mm -hmm. and that in later times he doesn't exactly say this, but he kind of implies it. The rabbis got confused, mm -hmm. and what the rabbis tended to do is they would they would have these figures and they would telescope five different people into one one person. Right. They do this with uh, King Yanai, who is um, Alexander Janaeus of the um, uh, discussed by Josephus, and, and we have coins that he minted mm -hmm. uh, today. So Alexander Yanai was the king of, um, of of Israel, actually, from 103 to 76 BC. But every king of the Hasmoneans that the rabbis don't like, they call King Yanai, mm -hmm. right? They call John Hyrcidus Yanai. So that what they do is they can, they take a bunch of different figures who have something in common from their perspective, and they kind of crunch them into one figure. Um, and the reason is that, you know, the rabbis had these legends and these stories and these, these traditions. They didn't necessarily know all that much about history, about which century things took place. So what Rabbi Soloveitchik shows here is that there's one Yeshua um, who's mentioned in the Talmud who uh, lived in the time of Rabbi Yoshua ben Parachia, sometime around 70 or 80 BC. Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> that's not Yeshua of Nazareth. <laughs> There's another one who lived during the time of Bar Kokhba, sometime yep. around 132 to 135 AD. Well, how could that be Yeshua of Nazareth? Um, so, so the point is that, so, so he makes the argument that there is a figure in the, in the Talmud called Yeshua, and that's not Yeshua of Nazareth. I would say it's a little bit different, that there's several different figures in the Talmud who the rabbis didn't care for, let's put it that way, they had disagreements with, and they kind of clumped them all together into one figure. One of those figures is the son of Papos, um, Papos who lived in the time of um, the Bar Kokhba revolt, right? And we don't know much about him. There's a lot of confusion about who that is exactly. Um, long story short, he's saying that you can't take statements in the Talmud about Yeshua and take those at his, as historical descriptions of Yeshua of Nazareth. Now, let me that's say... His, that, I, that's the bottom line there. I, I will say that something saying. that um, I, I found it a little a little um, strange that, that we started off with uh, Matthew 2, 1, and then he goes into these five pages. But then as I thought right. about it and reflected on it, actually, the timing of it is actually really perfect because I'll tell you something, I, mean, I, I don't know if you know this or not, but there are some people who um, would love to be able to make it simple and say, well, it was... This is, this, in other words, let me, let me back up a second. What I appreciated about what he was doing is he was further explaining um, the confusion around the statement. The statement is the Jews killed Jesus or Yeshua. Right. And he just went in to bring more information to say, now you're probably confused. You may have heard this statement in the Talmud. That's not the same person. You may have heard this statement in the Talmud. That's not the same person. So I, I actually appreciated what he was doing. It's right. just that it was... <laughs> And and there's there's definitely some truth in what he's saying. In yeah. other words, so this is a debate that goes back to the 13th century. The 13th century, mm -hmm. there was this Jewish convert to Christianity who wrote a letter to the Pope, and he said to the Pope, you've got to burn the Talmud because it's full of blasphemies against our Lord Jesus Christ. Right. And so they began what was known as the, the trial of Paris. Mm -hmm. And the Talmud was actually put on trial and the Jewish side was defended by a rabbi named Yechiel of Paris. Mm -hmm. And Rabbi Yechiel of Paris, he came up with this idea that Yeshu HaNotzri, Jesus of Nazareth in the Talmud, is not the same as Jesus Christ of the Christians. They lived in different periods, and they have different um, biographies. Um, even though in one place he's called Yeshu, Yeshu HaNotzri, Yeshu of Nazareth, at least in one place. Um, there was another rabbi in the same period uh, who we've talked about in our different uh, discussions, Nachmanides, uh, Rabbi Moshe Bar Nach Ben Nachman, Ramban in Hebrew, not to be confused with Rambam. Ramban, he had a, a dispute with Pablo Cristiani in 1263, and he argued that, no, it's, it is the figure. It's the same <laughs> figure, right? Um, that the rabbis just have different traditions about him than what we know from, from, um, from, from the New Testament. And look, it's very possible very likely, let's put it this way, most historians, if you ask them, can you take what the Talmud says about Jesus 
as historical information from the time of Jesus, what they would respond is, the rabbis had no idea about what happened in the life of Jesus. These are rabbis 100 or 200 to 300 years later who had a conversation with a Christian, and all they know about what Jesus taught or did is what they heard from that Christian. Mm -hmm. And there's something to be said for that. Mm -hmm. And that also explains why they take three or four different figures from history, a disciple of Rabbi Yeshua ben Parachia, uh, this figure during the time of the Bar Kokhba revolt, and probably the historical Jesus, and they telescope them into a single figure because they don't really know it's hundreds of years later. Mm. It's like, you know, uh, um, you'll, you'll talk to people, I don't know, about the American Revolution, and they'll think that George Washington everything did everything, or, or the Civil American Civil War, and they'll think that uh, Ulysses S. Grant went to Texas to free the slaves, right? Mm -hmm. Well, as far as I know, Grant never went to Texas. It was your ancestor, right? <laughs> um, so, so, you know, today we can look it up on Wikipedia, and hopefully that's true half the time, uh, uh, at least half the time. Um, there's, you know, there's ways of finding things out. Back then, they just had their memories, right? These things weren't even written down. It was my rabbi told me this story, and his rabbi told him this story, and a lot of it gets confused in the telling. So there's some truth that when the rabbis are talking about certain figures, Look, there's a figure the rabbis talk about, they call him Poshe Yisrael, the sinner of Israel. And some rabbis came along and said, that's a euphemism for Jesus. Mm -hmm. I don't know, maybe it is, maybe it isn't, right? There's another rabbi who's called the other one. Mm -hmm. Who's the other one? Well, we know that's, well, we don't know. We think that's not Jesus. The other one is, is another rabbi who became an apostate, who um, became uh, essentially a, um, an Epicurean who denied that God had interaction with the world. So there's all these coded terms in the Talmud, mm -hmm. right? There's the ben, this ben Stata, and they're trying to figure out who is this son of Stata? Well, he's some arch villain who has a huge following who people thought was a Messiah. Well, who else is a, from the perspective of the rabbis, uh, someone we disagree with who people think is a Messiah who has a huge following? So they combine these two figures who have nothing to do with each other. And, and maybe he puts this here in chapter two, because, you know, up until now, you could say we're dealing with kind of um, not the actual life of Jesus, but, but in a sense, the, um, I mean, you're dealing with the virgin birth, which is, if you believe it, it's a miracle, right? Mm -hmm. So in a sense, it's not really part of history, right? That's what historians, secular historians would say. It's not part of, we, a secular historian can't deal with it as history because it's a supernatural event. You believe it, great. You don't, then you don't. Um, uh, here we're dealing maybe for the first time with, we know Herod, he existed, right? We know these are events in history, right? That um, Herod killed anybody who opposed him. Uh, uh, and we'll get to that in a minute. But famously, um, uh, Augustus, the uh, Augustus Caesar, he famously said, it's better to be Herod's son, uh, pig than his son. It's better to be Herod's pig than his son. And why is that? Because Herod, being sort of a Jew, doesn't eat pig, uh, and therefore doesn't kill pigs, but he does kill his sons. Uh, Herod literally killed his own son. I believe he drowned him in a bathtub or something like that. Um, so the point is that uh, now we're getting to history. So the rabbi's stepping up and he's saying, okay, what do we know from history about Jesus? Well, no, we're not looking at the Talmud. We're not looking at Toldot Yeshu. Those are legends. Some of them aren't even about Jesus of Nazareth. They're, they're, so let's look at the New Testament, take it at face value and try to understand what it says. You know, now I, I want to say something that, that I, and again, why I appreciated what he did is that he's really setting a foundation in terms of how we're going to be studying the New Testament, how we're going to be studying the Hebrew For gospel sure. of Matthew. By him taking those five pages, like you say, people saying, well, what about the fact that they did this? He's like, look, before we go any further, let me clarify something. And I, I don't know if you know this or not, but there are some people that aren't so happy that a Jew and Gentile are going to be looking at the New Testament. In fact, I've had some people that say, if you do that, I'm not going to be a part of what you're doing. So, uh, and I, I think this is a gift. And I believe that what your, what your cousin is trying to establish is the foundation for how we have to go forward, which I call it mutual respect. I, I think the most important takeaway from this five page excursus that he has on, on, uh, on the Jesus's, uh, Jesus's plural of the Talmud is, is to be really careful when we use these sources, um, if it refers to a figure and doesn't even call him Jesus, don't assume that that's Jesus, Yeshua. Right. What he's doing really is he's using the Talmud critically, right? He's saying, okay, well, who are they talking about here? Wait a minute. That was 70 years before, the, at least we think, that Yeshua was born. Mm -hmm. So how could that be the same figure? Mm -hmm. 
So, well, what, um, yeah. What I like about what you said, though, is that when we get to this verse, we're transitioning from the chapter one, which I have to admit, I mean, you talk about some landmines. There's some there's some big landmines in, in chapter one. But when we get to chapter two, verse one, now I'm telling yeah. you something. I, yeah. I guarantee you, Nehemiah, that when you read chapter two, verse one was different than the experience of me reading Gen, uh, Matthew chapter two, verse one. And I want to make a, a, a I want to do an experiment, a yeah. simple experiment. Um, so you're reading in, in the New Testament, you get to Matthew chapter two, verse one, and it says, now after Jesus, reading the NASB, now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, Magi from the east, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, and for me, I have never in my life ever slowed down with that yeah. verse until the Hebrew gospel of Matthew. Okay. Now, when I read the Hebrew gospel of Matthew, I had a question for you. And, and I, yes, I, you're not going to remember, this was years ago that you did this with me in Jerusalem. Yeah. It says in the Hebrew Gospel of Matthew, now it was as a, when Yeshua was born in Bethlehem, uh, Yehuda, in the days of Herod the king, and behold, uh, Hosim uh, in stars, and uh, wise men, what do you want to say? in stars, came uh, from the east to Jerusalem. Now, never in my life have I ever stopped with in the days of Herod. Never. Do you remember when you first, uh, you're not going to remember this, but we talked about who Herod was and yeah. it, it was, it, it was eye opening. And, and all I thought about was when you hear Herod, what do you think versus what I think? When I think of Herod, I just, it doesn't, it, it didn't really mean much to me when I was reading this for years and years and years. Yeah. But when we do language, history and context, this verse, if you don't know who Herod is, you don't understand why or what's happening. Look, and this could be the reason that this is where Rabbi Soloveitchik decided to talk about the anti-Semitism that some people derive from the New Testament and then run with it. Because Herod, the first connotation a Jew has when he hears Herod is, Tell me. oh, that guy, that guy who murdered, persecuted. I mean, uh, so, so, I, I, I don't want to compare the two. Uh, the, the best comparison I can give is talk to uh, Russian people about Stalin. Mm -hmm. That's how Jews feel about Herod. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and, and so, th so this is an interesting thing. We're going to get to this, but, but there's something profound in verse three that the Christian understands that the Jew understands something completely different. That's what I want to hear. I, um, so, so when you hear Herod, again, when you hear yeah. in the days of Herod, would, when you so think So Herod was an interesting figure. Exactly. His ancestor had been an uh, Edomite. Yep. The Edomites had come into Southern Judea during the 70 years that the Jews were in the Babylonian exile. Mm -hmm. And when the Jews came back under Zerubbabel, they never reconquered that area of Southern Judea. And what mm -hmm. do I mean by Southern Judea? Uh, Hebron, Beersheba, all that area was uh, occupied territory controlled by the Edomians, who are the Edomites, mm -hmm. the biblical Edomites. Uh, then you had a series of wars of conquest by John Hyrcanus, followed by um, Aristobulus and Alexander Janaeus, Alexander Yana, who we mentioned before. Mm -hmm. And during these wars of conquest, they expanded the area of Judea. Now, in the Torah, it talks about uh, uh, driving out the nations because they worship idols. Um, but we actually see an example in Joshua where there was a Canaanite who didn't have to be driven out. And who was that? That was Rahab. Mm -hmm. She had a choice. Instead of being forced to leave the land, she could become an Israelite. Mm -hmm. And so these Hasmonean uh, uh, rulers and kings eventually, when they conquered these areas, they uh, said to the local inhabitants, you can leave from our ancestral territory, from Galilee and from Idumea, or you become you can become Israelites. Mm -hmm. How do you become Israelites? Get circumcised and start following the laws of the Torah. And so the Idumeans were converted to Judaism. Mm -hmm. Now, in the history, it's described as they were forcibly converted to Judaism, although they, I mean, they were in some respect, right? But they had the option to leave. Um, so Herod's ancestors were forcibly converted to Judaism, forcibly on some level, right? They, like I said, they could have left. But in reality, it was they were kind of forced, and uh, it never really took. Mm -hmm. So if you look at all the great buildings that Herod built... <laughs> <laughs> he built the temple to Augustus mm -hmm. uh, in Samaria and Sebastia. Uh, to this day, you can go 
or at least when I was studying 20 years ago at the, at the, um, the uh, uh, Institute of Archaeology at Hebrew University of Jerusalem on Mount Scopus, they have a statue of Augustus there. That was a statue of Augustus that was unearthed at Sebastia at, at the town of Shomron, which was renamed Sebastia, um, in the temple to Augustus. Mm -hmm. Augustus was treated as a god and worshipped as a god. Sacrifices were brought to him. And, and, and so, you know, I think maybe some Christians have this idea that Herod was this great figure for the Jews. I think a lot of Christians know this isn't true. But some have this idea he was this great figure for the Jews. He rebuilt the temple and made it beautiful and, and, and um, you know, giant stones, some of which are still there to this day. But in reality, he did the same for the pagan temples. He built new pagan temples in Sebastia, in uh, Caesarea. And so what is a Jewish king doing building all these pagan temples? This Jewish king is uh, an Edomite who um, was forced to convert to Judaism and despised certainly uh, the Jew his Jewish uh, subjects. Um, in the year 40 BC, Herod uh, came to power and he was almost immediately overthrown by a Jewish uprising. The Jewish uprising was backed by, um, by Jews who had come from uh, Parthia, from actually from Babylonia, which was part of the Parthian Empire. And they said, look, if you overthrow Herod, we'll intervene and you won't be under Roman rule anymore. We'll give you a great degree of autonomy, just like we do the, the rabbis here in Babylonia. Uh, this is what the Persians told them, the Parthian Empire. And they were successful. They defeated him. He had to flee. Um, he then goes to Rome. This is Herod. And in Rome, he says, look, the Jews will never accept me unless I'm a king. That's right. At that point, he, had been, he wasn't a king. He was an ethnarch that is the ruler of an ethnic group, of an, a nationality. Um, so they made him king, and he comes back, and he uses military force to reconquer the land. Um, it took him about three years, around 37 BC, he reconquers Israel, and then he begins a reign of terror. Why the reign of terror? The Jews never accepted him as king. Number one, in, in Deuteronomy, it says in chapter 17, if you choose a king, he will be one of your bro brethren. This man was an Edomite. He had no business business being king. He wasn't from the line of Judah. He wasn't from the line of David. He was a false king. Mm -hmm. Now, there had been Hasmoneans who had been kings, mm -hmm. and they were resisted by a lot of people. The Hasmoneans were the Maccabees from the Hanukkah story. Mm -hmm. Eventually, originally they were high priests, but later they installed themselves as king, beginning with Aristobulus or possibly with Yanai, Alexander Janaeus. Around 104, 103, they proclaimed themselves kings and there's a lot of people who say, wait a minute, you're a high priest from the line of Aaron. You can't be king. What kind of king are you? You're an illegal king. Right. And so some people accepted them, some didn't. Almost nobody accepted Herod. And so he had to use brute force to get the people to accept him. And the history of Herod, as told by Josephus, is one massacre after another massacre after another massacre. About 10 or 15 years ago, they discovered the tomb of Herod at Herodian, which is near Tekoa, about, you can actually see it from Mount Scopus uh, in, in northern Jerusalem, but it's actually south of Jerusalem. It's this peak that, it's an artificial peak that sticks up. You can see it from Mount Scopus. They, uh, Ehud Netzer, a professor at Hebrew University, who actually died in the excavations, he gave his life to find this. Uh, he fell while they were excavating this, this, um, this kind of like hill. He found the tomb of Herod, and he found the, the sarcophagus of Herod, which was this beautiful red marble sarcophagus. It was smashed into a thousand pieces. Why was it smashed into a thousand pieces? Because the people hated Herod so much that as soon as they got the opportunity during the Jewish revolt in 66 CE, they captured Herodian uh, and, and smashed into as many pieces as they could his tomb, his grave, because they, were, they hated him so much. So the people hate Herod. So as soon as you hear in the time of King Herod, you're like, oh no, what else did he do? But here's <laughs> this, this, is why, this is why I wanted to stop. And again, please folks, don't be frustrated. Um, I don't think you can read Matthew chapter two and you hear the days of Herod and not understand some history. We talk about three things, language, history, and context. So for me, what I did, Nehemiah, when I first read this, I stopped. And I remember our conversation. And you know, you're a walking history book. I love it, man. We could talk about this. But what I would is I went and got a source, which is for those who just want to see a nice little 45 minutes or an hour based on some of the sources, I found a video on Herod. 
and I want to encourage people to watch it. It's really actually kind of entertaining. Okay, but it's we'll historically... link to it from, uh, from, from the website. Yeah, and so basically at international.com, make it also available, Nahemi, if you'd like to use it, but bas- at uh, nahemiaswald.com. But I don't think you go into Matthew chapter 2 unless you understand something about Herod. And and we're gonna and you're gonna find this out when we get to verse three. But that stopped me in my tracks. And I know for you, when you read it, you're like, yeah, Herod. Well, I didn't I didn't even know when I first read it. And for years, even when I was at the evangelical seminary, no one ever told mm. me about Herod. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, who's Herod? Let's get to let's get to you know, yeah. baby Jesus is what I want to talk about. So my point is this really is important, folks. You really need the history, yes. language, history, and context. Herod, without understanding who he is, where he came from, and what he did. I don't think people understand at all what's happening in this yeah. in this chapter. So now, can we talk about the star of Bethlehem? Oh, we have to. <laughs> so we've got these these guys, and I almost said it. I almost said we got these three guys. <laughs> you right? almost said it. <laughs> I literally almost said that and caught wait, myself wait, and stopped wait. me. Let me stop so, for a second. So I, I read yeah. that. And I said, "We three kings of Orient are," and then I thought, "Wait, where does it say three kings?" <laughs> right. You don't know that so, song, but then I So let, let's start with that, that in the New Testament, it never <laughs> says there's three of them. Yeah. It never says they're kings. Right. In the Greek, it says they're ma- uh, magoi, which is yep. uh, magi. Mm-hmm. Magi is, um, well, it's interesting what it is. Magi are Zoroastrian priests. Mm-hmm. Um, that's the literal meaning of it. Um, you might think it's the word magicians, which it is on some level. Um, it, c- let's talk about something that's said here in, in the Jewish annotated New Testament. And I want to bring this as an example of how to study. Mm -hmm. So I'm reading here in the Jewish Annotated New Testament. That's another one of our sources on page five. And he says, the wise men, Greek magi, early Jewish readers may have regarded these Persian astrologers not as wise, but as foolish or evil. Yes. Philo calls Balaam a magos. Mm -hmm. And he gives the reference in in Philo. See also Daniel 2.2 and the Septuagint. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So, I was going to cite this and say, you know, from the Christian perspective, from the Gentile perspective, Magi are very impressive. But from the Jewish perspective, <laughs> Magi are these evil uh, uh, Zoroastrian priests that persecuted the Jews. Right. They were they were base astrologers and idolaters, and no Jew would be impressed by that. That's what I was going to present. Um, and I decided to do something a little bit radical. I was I was talking yesterday to T Bone. We did a quick brainstorming session. Uh, and doing that a lot kind of forced me, okay, I'm going to look up this, like T-Bone say, well, how do you know that? Well, it says it right here. Okay. Well, wait a minute. I got to look this up myself. So I look up in Philo and here's what Philo says about Magi. Mm. And now he's not talking about Yeshua. He's not talking about the new Testament. He's talking about how there's this group of priests who are Zoroastrian priests. For those who don't know, Zoroaster was a Persian, uh, they call him a prophet, a Persian prophet or a religious leader. Sometime, we don't know exactly around 600 BC, who started a new religion called Zoroastrianism. It's the religion that says there are two gods, a good God and an evil God. Um, Cyrus of Persia, Cyrus the Great, was a Zoroastrian, a Zoroastrian, which is why in Isaiah 45, God says, I make good and I make evil, right? Don't, even though you didn't know me, Cyrus, you, you worship your gods and know about your God. Well, they only worship the good God. They hate the evil God. Um, guess what? I, Yehovah, do all these things. So, so Zoroastrian is, is alluded to in the Tanakh there, if you know the cultural context. Um, the priests of the Zoroastrians were called Magi. It was actually a, a, a tribe, just like Kohanim in Hebrew. Well, Kohanim means priests. But when you say Kohanim, you generally mean Kohanim from the line of Aaron, right? There was a specific tribe, descendants of Aaron. So with the Zoroastrians, it's believed it was a specific tribe, the, the Magi, uh, or the Ma- uh, Magoi. Um, so... These Magi in uh, Philo, here's what Philo says about them. Contrary to what the Jewish annotated New Testament tells us, and I'm glad I looked it up, um, it's true. In Philo, the life of Moses, 1, 192, Pharaoh's magicians are called Magi. Balaam is called a Magi, a Magus. That's a, a singular, Magos. In uh, life of Moses, 1, 276. However, in the book Free, 70, number se- section 74, Philo writes, among the Persians, there is the body of the Magi who investigating the work of works of nature for the purposes of becoming acquainted with the truth, do as their leisure become initiated themselves and initiate others in the divine virtues by clear explanations. Mm-hmm. Plain English, they're scientists and scholars, mm-hmm. according to Philo, 
Mm-hmm. I was really surprised to hear this because my impression of Magi is those pagan Zoroastrian priests who worship fire and feed their dead to vultures, which I'm is what so they do. I'm so glad you did something that you've always <laughs> talked about for as long as I've known you, which is one, find out the sources, see what it's, you see what it says, and, and do everything you can to bring different perspectives to try to come to a place of understanding. I, I have to tell you, yeah. Nehemiah, when I read it yeah. without going any further, I immediately thought about, yeah. okay, because there's something that happens. In English, it says this. It says the mag, the, uh, the, the magi or whatever you want to say in English. But in Hebrew, Matthew, it says these were the the hosim of stars. So right. when I'm when so it doesn't the have stargazers, a star, uh, it, it, astrologers, or astronomers, yeah. depending how you depending but on your perspective. I want to tell you something. So when I read it, immediately my, my perspective started to expand, and I started yeah. asking this simple question. So they're yeah. coming from the east. I'm not going to verse two yet. I'm not going to verse three. Okay. I'm just talking about verse one. They're coming okay. from the east. They're going to Jerusalem. Something happened in the heavens. They yeah. saw it. And in fact, you know, can we go into the next verse? Because it, I, I want to finish with the Magi. Yeah, because, so, well, here's so, the point I wanted to make was yeah. when I saw it, I didn't think of them as uh, what you said there, the, like, like what it Zoroastrian said in the annotated priests. Jewish Bible. But I was expanding possibly who they were and why it was that this caught their attention. Continue. And just to give you an idea, like in the Talmud, it mentions Magi. Mm -hmm. uh, It's called Amagosh. And it describes them as these these kind of fools Mm -hmm. who believe stupid things. Like there's a story where one uh, Magi, or Magus, he says to a a rabbi named Amemar, he says that, uh, well, Ahura Mazda, the good God, he controls from your waist up. And uh, I remind you, the evil God, he controls from your waist down. And this is one of the ideas of the of the of the Zoroastrians, that everything physical, carnal, uh, mm-hmm. is evil, right? Your uh, um, genital areas, those belong to the evil God, and that's why you have lust. But your heart and your mind, those belong to the good God. So the rabbi responds to him. He says, why does the good God uh, let, uh, how do I, I don't know if I should use a euphemism here. Don't use the euphemism. He says, why does the good God let piss pass through his territory? In other words, the the Zoroastrian pe- priests they see um, feces and urine as unclean things, and therefore they come from the bottom of your body because they belong to the evil god, and you should sanctify yourself. This is what, by the way, where we get the idea of blessing the food in Christianity. Uh, I, you know, in Judaism we don't bless the food; we bless God for the food. Mm-hmm. Christianity has this uh, Zoroastrian um, um, echo, in a sense, which came through the, um, uh, who are those people called? They were called the um, Gnostics, who had who had adopted some of these ideas. And so this idea that the food is evil and you wouldn't put it in the sacred temple without first blessing it, right? So the rabbi says, wait a minute, if the top half of your body is sacred and the bottom half is profane, why does the urine, why does the liquid pass through and eventually become urine? Um, it's going through the holy part, right? And he, and he's kind of using logic to show how ridiculous the Magi are, right? Um, right. You're, it's, it's one body, right? And one God controls everything, right? And the same God who created your heart and your mind and your soul also created your feces and your urine. It's the same creator of the universe. That's what, I, that's what Isaiah 45 is talking about. Mm-hmm. And, and so he's explaining this to the Mag- Magus. And the point is, the rabbis did look upon these um, magi, at least at a certain point in history, as as sort of like foolish, silly priests. Mm-hmm. But there was another view in the first century. You see, Philo actually has a lot of respect for them. Uh, now, what, what's the context there in Philo? This is important. The context in Philo is that people think the magi perform magic, but what they're actually doing is they're studying nature so they can manipulate nature, mm-hmm. right? If you want to turn, um, I don't know, uh, one substance into another, right? That later became alchemy. What's the difference between alchemy and chemistry? Mm-hmm. The difference between alchemy, alchemy is where you turn two substances into a third or one substance into another substance. The difference between that and chemistry is in chemistry, we say there's a natural explanation. And in alchemy, they say there's a supernatural mystical explanation. Mm-hmm. And so he's saying the Zoroastrian, Zoroastrian magi might be misunderstood that people think that they're performing magic, but actually they're studying nature in order to understand it better, just like scientists would today. They didn't have the word scientist, right? That's it's a modern term. So is it fair to say, Nehemiah, at least for me, at least for me, yeah. when I looked at verse 1 of chapter 2, 
there were three things, very simply, yeah. that jumped off the page. And each of these three things needed a closer look. The first thing was born in Bethlehem. The second thing was Herod the king. The third thing was the Magi. And each three of the, all three of those things, if I look at why was it significant that he was born in Bethlehem, before we even get to we didn't Herod even talk about born in question, Bethlehem. <laughs> meaning my point is, is that even yeah. in the first verse, poop, poop, poop. And each of those things take uh, uh, what I call are crying out for some attention, some some big attention. So I think yeah. that's well, what we're trying to. And the funny thing is, uh, when I was I was you know kind of like putting together my notes yesterday, I thought what what we're gonna have. I actually said this to you. I said let's do all of chapter two because there's no way Listen, we have enough and this material. Is, I want people to, to know something, and, and you guys really need we're to not understand. Even get to half the things. You need to understand this. Nehemi and I are not ahead of time producing this. We're not ahead of time. We haven't, he's talking about, he speaks to T-Bone. He doesn't even talk to me until it's time for us to turn on the recorder. So my yeah. point is, is that we're actually in the process of study. And what I want to challenge people to do, and I, I really do need to say this, Nehemiah, I want to challenge people to study with us. Nehemiah, this is so beautiful to me because yeah. here we're talking about one verse. And, and listen, I, we could go another hour on one verse. I'm telling you. Let's just talk about Beit well, Lechem. I guess my point is the intention was not to do one verse. It was no. To of, do the listen, whole but it doesn't matter. My point is, is that this is in real time because for me, I yeah. want to talk about before we move on. Let's talk about yeah. he was born in Bethlehem, and even though it talks about it later, all, all right, so talk to me about born in Bethlehem. All three of those things, all three of those things, uh, for me, jump off the page. And again, the only reason that I slowed down, the only reason, yeah. is because I'm having to go word by word in the Hebrew Gospel of Matthew. Right. I'm well, we'll you. get to Bethlehem, I feel like, in verse 5, so can we save that? Oh, I, um, we're going to save it all. I mean, <laughs> Okay, well. But it's so already, two, we've already been going nearly an hour already. So, in let, 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 let's, let's ask this question, and it's a really good question. What is the significance? Let's say these aren't Magi. Let's say they're just people who have studied the stars. What is the significance that these people who studied stars came and... That's um, what w- what's going on here? Yes. W- why is this important? Why is this important? Be a Jewish reader who's listening to Matthew teach this in the first century. Now. And also be a Greek reader. Yes. So the Greeks had this idea that all, uh, or some Greeks had the idea, that for knowledge to be really important, it had to be exotic. Right? So they talked about the Babylonians teach and, and, the, and the Persians teach. And this is, this is an idea in the Greek world. And, and the Jews teach if somebody from a foreign culture teaches something, it has more importance. So that's how many uh, New Testament interpreters take this passage. They say, oh, okay, the Greeks are, are, are they're Greek disciples, and they want to give Jesus more legitimacy. So they make, this is what, what um, in many seminaries is taught. So they, so they, they create this story, or the, 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 the legend develops that not only was Jesus a fulfillment of uh, Old Testament prophecy, but that there were uh, these foreigners who even recognized his his um, that 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 something happened supernatural to foretell his coming. You can read in the New Testament commentaries written by Christians, some evangelical Christians, that that there were Zoroastrian legends that somebody would be born, um, uh, and that there was a star which signify where he was born. Of course, there's the whole question of what did the star do. We definitely don't have time to get into that. People have written whole books about it. Mm-hmm. Um, I know there's one suggestion in the Hebrew Roots movement that that this was a prophecy of Daniel that he left to his disciples, and there was this there was this guild of of of, of wise men who uh, continued after Daniel from uh, 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 I don't know uh, I'll call it rabbi rabbi's disciple preserving the prophecy, and then finally it was fulfilled. Mm-hmm. That's not in the text, right? could be that that's what happened. That's not in this text. But what is the significance, whether they were Magi or, or astronomers or astrologers, that they came in and saw this star? What, what's going on? Why is it important that they came from the East? Nehemiah, I'm going to have you take out your tap tap for one second. Okay. And yeah. I want you to look up, if you ever see an example of the Hebrew word that we have here in terms of stars, our star, mm-hmm. and yeah. if you have that anywhere connected to any sort of messianic, uh, oh, we'll get to that. Well, okay, <laughs> you're, you're jumping what ahead. Mean? What is this? We'll get to that. Wait, 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 wait. There's a messianic <laughs> prophecy, obviously, in the in the Tanakh. I should say, obviously, Jews know of an obvious messianic prophecy in the Tanakh. Christians generally, I think, probably don't know about it. 
But call, oh, hold hold your horses there. You're, you're jumping to the end. You're stealing no, my thunder. No, I'm in the first verse. <laughs> okay. Um, before we get to that, I, 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 look, we're about to we're about to end part one, but I, I want to get at least through the end of verse three before we end part one. Can we do I'm that? I'm not going to the end of verse three. No. Not what are you talking three. about? We, we're in ver- Listen, folks, and, and I really mean this. Yeah. If you slow down with the Hebrew Gospel of Matthew, and again, we got to remember something. Nehemiah, I want you to I want you to accept something right now. Yeah. I like I say, I think you're one of the smartest men I know. And 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 literally from your perspective and what you where you come from, when you're reading these verses, I mean you clickety, 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 click. For me, this is revelatory stuff to have to slow down and say, who are the Hosim in, in who are these wise men uh, in stars? And why do I want and, and English doesn't even give me stars in verse one. The English yeah. simply says the Magi. In Hebrew, it says they were wise men of stars. I'm going to stop right there. Language, history, yeah. context. I want to find out where stars. What are the? What, what is this? Okay. I mean, this is what we're trying to do. We're going verse by verse by verse. There's no rush. There is All no right. rush. Let's start in Genesis 1:16. Yes. God made the two great lights: the greater light to rule the day, and the lesser light to rule the night, and the stars. And then it says, um, "Sorry, I want to read verse 14 actually." Mm-hmm. And uh, Yehovah Elohim said, or sorry, Elohim said. Let there be lights in the firmament of heaven to separate between the day and between the night, and they shall be for signs and for appointed times and for days and for years. And so so this idea that that there's um, <laughs> things in the heaven yes. that could be signs yes. is, yes. is not without some biblical basis. Um, absolutely. We're not- However, there, there, there's, there's two different views of it, right? In other words, there are signs that, that aren't from, from God, that um, meaning that a lot of the ancient peoples were very superstitious, and they believed in all kinds of of, of signs and omens. And not every one of the astrology isn't true. Can we agree on that? When you say astrology isn't true, what do you mean? Yeah, what I mean is the ancient pagans and the modern newspaper has this idea that if you're born under a certain constellation, oh, you're talking you should about get that into a relationship a, on this okay. month, yes. and this month you shouldn't, said and this day yes. you should go to war, yes. and this day you shouldn't, because nothing to do with you, but there's something because of, of you're controlled or your future is foretold by the stars. I understand what you that, mean by that. That's astrology. Yes. Um, Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 1, hear the word that Jehovah spoke to you, O house of Israel. Now, we just read in Genesis 1.14 that God created the sun, the moon, and the stars for signs, among other things. But verse 2 here says, Thus says Yehovah, Do not learn the way of the nations, or be dismayed at the signs of the heavens, for the nations are dismayed at them. Right? So they have this astrology where they say, um, Oh, I mean, literally, I had a guy come to my house to fix my computer. He couldn't fix it. And he says to me, I can tell you the solution. He had been there like three times. Finally says, I'm going to tell you. No one else will tell you what really happened. Mercury's in retrograde. And I'm thinking like, um, so is there some component in the computer that that's a Mercury switch or something? Like He's like, no, 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 no. The planet Mercury's in retrograde. This is a computer technician in the 21st century telling me that the reason my computer could not be fixed. And by the way, it couldn't be fixed in the end. It had to be recalled. Um, the reason my computer couldn't be fixed, it was a one in a million, I'm told, by Toshiba, that uh, uh, so they claimed. Um, never bought a Toshiba since. But one in a million problem, and the reason is Mercury's in retrograde. This is what Jeremiah is speaking of when he says, do not learn the ways of the nations or be dismayed at the signs of the heavens, for the nations are dismayed at them. And yet, So it is true Nehemiah, that God can... Si- and yet, Nehemiah, yeah. in the first verse of Matthew... Chapter 2, verse 1, whatever happened with these wise men of stars, something yeah. told them not just, you know, look at the stars, but actually go to Jerusalem. I, I, I want to talk to you now. But we we got to talk about verse 3. I, I know you, uh, or verse 2. Uh, well, I'm, I'm going to leave this as an open question. Why is, what's the significance that there's people who, and maybe there's no significance, maybe it just happened, right? But presumably, there's some significance of why we're being told it happened. There, there, um, v- people who who there are astrologers of some sort or astronomers from the east, and uh, and they um, and they're bringing important gifts and they're coming to bow down to him. Boy, we could talk for an hour about bow down to him. 
Um, I don't know if we want to let's, can we just talk for a minute? <laughs> How is it that they knew even to bow? Down? Why would they think to bow down to, to let's say he's the king. Do you bow down to Kings? So in the Tanakh, you do in the Tanakh, you bow down to Kings. Okay. And certainly in the ancient world, you bow down to Kings. So, so, and here's a question, um, that I'm just going to throw out there, right? Let's assume every single thing happened here exactly as we're told. This was a miracle. God wanted his will known. So he revealed the star, whatever that means, to these uh, Eastern Magi. Um, how, would, and, and, oh, how would they know to bow down to him? Does this mean they said, oh, the second person of the Trinity has manifest here on earth? Did they know that theology? Or did they just have the idea that any miraculous king is also somehow a god? Or certainly worthy of being bowed down to? I mean, you bowed down to even flesh and blood kings back then. Let the text speak, Nehemiah. The text says okay. this. They ask yeah. the question, if you insist on going to verse 2, which we will, mm -hmm. where is the king of the Jews who has been born? We have seen his, now tap, tap for me, just for a second. Yeah. Give people just yeah, a yeah. tap, tap. What was the word they use in verse 2? So there's... Two different readings in Hebrew Matthew. Some manuscripts, like the British Library manuscripts, has Sivivo. We saw his surroundings in the East. Mm -hmm. Not sure what that means. Um, it could other manuscripts have we saw his star in the East. Mm -hmm. Now, whether or not you read star or surroundings in this verse, there's definitely a star that they saw in verses seven, nine, and ten. Excellent. In all the manuscripts. Excellent. Excellent. So now, maybe they saw his surroundings. Maybe they saw some kind of an aura. Yeah. Maybe, maybe. they saw some and glowing you know what, light. Folks, I don't know. Everyone else that's out there like me, listen, like if everyone you're yeah. like me and you slow down and you read this, I don't care if you decide you want to come to the next section or not. If you just stick in this first verse and you look at these issues of the place that he was born, what 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 it, what it was that caused the Magi or the, 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 the wise men from the East to come to Jerusalem— Whatever it is, I'm telling you, if this verse, Nehemiah, I, it took me days. I was so blessed for this process that mm -hmm. we were really slowing down and looking at it. So like I said, yeah. I'm in no hurry. Now, it's already been an hour. Yeah. We've been talking about one verse again. <laughs> well, no, we got to verse three, um, <laughs> verse two. Hey, so so T-Bone, when I was talking to him, he said the big question for him in verse two is what kind of a chutzpah, what kind of a gall do these foreigners have? They come to Israel and they say to the as far as they know, the king of Israel, we heard your replacement was born. <laughs> and, and listen, Nehemiah. Wow. Not yeah. just that, that, they, that yeah. they said that. Listen, Herod's already, I mean, this is why you got to understand Herod. You don't bring up any other possibility of a king. <laughs> right, right. Not with him. So Herod's the guy who's, who, who murdered his own uh, son. Yeah. Oh, he man. murdered, I think you, it was his wife or his yeah, mother-in-law. Yeah. He murdered so many people just to prevent that. Yeah, it was mm -hmm. one of his wives who was a Hasmonean. Mm -hmm. um, he killed all these people to prevent them from, from taking over his rule, yeah. people who had more legitimacy than him. So the idea of, of a king who's from the line of Judah, that... Um, uh, uh, of course, and this is an important, qu another question here. Okay. Let's look, uh, let's read verses two and three here. Uh, they say, where is the king of the Jews who was born? We saw his surroundings or we saw his star in the East, depending how you read it. And they came with important gifts to bow down to him. And Herod the king heard, Vaibahel, and he was dismayed. And the word there implies quickness. He's like, oh, this is really bad. Mm -hmm. And all the inhabitants of Jerusalem with him. Now, I was reading different commentaries to see how they understood this, how they understood this whole passage. And one of the Christian commentaries explained that what's going on here is that this is essentially pre a prefiguration. This is um, anticipating what will happen in the future, which is that the Gentiles will accept Jesus, but the Jews will reject him. That is how some Christians understand this. And I wonder if that's why uh, Rabbi Soloveitchik brought in the whole issue of, uh, of, of, of Christians and Jews who look at this, who look at the life of Yeshua and say to each other, um, we have a gripe with each other. 
Um, in other words, they take verse three to be, hey, we're really upset that Yeshua is born. We, we, before we even met him, we reject him as our king. Mm. That, that's, that is the way many Christians read verse three. You know, and, Nehemiah, yeah. I have to, I, you know, it won't be often that I'll, I'll, I'll disagree with you. Uh, yep. But I'll disagree with you on that. That if you understand who Herod is, and it, and what I understand. Oh, if is, you understand who Herod is, sure. No, no, I'm saying. Well, okay. So yeah. then, in, in Hebrew Matthew, again, since we're talking about is the Hebrew Gospel of Matthew, also. Yes. It says of those who dwelt with him. So when I'm thinking, well, who dwelt with Herod? So there's the power base that's with Herod to make sure that that line. I mean, who knows? It isn't all of Jerusalem. Maybe it's just the people that are with Herod that's upset. Let's say it's all. Let's say it's all Jerusalem. I right? don't think it's all of Jerusalem. Let, let, let's say it is. Why would they be dismayed? I understand why Herod's dismayed. Right. He's dismayed because he's going to be replaced as king what, yeah. a, as he sees it. Why would, they, and by the way, everyone's still thinking here of a flesh and blood ruler on earth. Um, why is it that uh, the people of Jerusalem would be dismayed? So here again, history, language, and context. We talked how uh, in the, around the year 40 to 37 BCE, the Jews revolted against the Romans with the help of the Parthians. And what was the Roman response? They sent Herod with the military to crush the revolt. Mm -hmm. Thousands of Jews were killed, tens of thousands. Uh, much later, about 30 years later, there is a man named Simon of Perea. He is a slave of Herod, and he leads a Jewish revolt. Josephus describes this in, in uh, War 2, 57-59, and Antiquities 17, 273-277. I want to read just quickly about this. There was also Simon, Josephus tells us, mm -hmm. who had been a slave of Herod the king. This man was so bold to put a crown on his head, while a certain number of the people stood by. In other words, this man, who is Simon of Perea, mm -hmm. is claiming to be the king of Israel <laughs> and rebelling against Herod. And I guarantee you one of his arguments was, Herod ain't even one of us. He's an Idumean, mm -hmm. and I am a true Israelite. So you have this guy, Simon of Perea, who goes and it says he also set fire to many other of the king's houses in several places of the country and utterly destroyed them. He's uh, burning down things and destroying cities. So when they have somebody who claims to be the Messiah, there's always something that follows. And that is the Messiah fails and there's horrible persecution. Mm -hmm. Simon of Perea is one of them. Um, another is called Judah of Gamla, or in the book of Acts, he's called Judas the Galilean. Right? He's mentioned by Gamaliel when uh, Paul is on trial. Josephus talks about him at length. He rose up uh, around this time as well, and he led a rebellion against the Romans, and it led to horrible persecution. Jews were killed in the tens of thousands because of this revolt. You know, when the Romans come to put down the revolt, they have no way of knowing who supported the, the, this uh, messianic claimant and who didn't. They just kill everybody in sight who they get their hands on. And, you know, and let the, let the crosses sort it out, meaning they literally will put tens of thousands of people on crosses and kill them and, and murder them in just horrific ways, the Romans did. So, so the point is the Jews of Jerusalem have a very good reason to be dismayed. They hear these foreigners come and say, that, say we heard that your, your king was born and there's something miraculous about it, um, right? They see a star. So here's, here's an important point. Why are they upset? Because when... Herod here is he's going to lose his kingdom. The inhabitants of Jerusalem here, oh no, not another Simon of Perea, not another Judas the Galilean. This is going to lead to more Roman persecution. That's what they're thinking. It's not that the Messiah has come and they reject him before they even met him. What they're thinking is another one of these. We're going to get persecuted again. That's certainly one possibility. I think there may have been people that were dwelling with Herod that was like, hey, we're in the power base. We're, it's our that party be that's running well. the show here. We don't want that to change. And maybe the other people are like, look, this feels biblical. This feels like it's within the snock. I mean, there's another group of people that are probably extremely excited. I mean, those folks came all the way from the east based on something that is in the sky. I mean, I I don't know. I I, I saw it a little bit different. But I mean, I, I, what I love about this is, and I especially am excited yeah. that we can go um, further into this because, um, Wait, yeah. I mean, Nehemi, I mean, I don't even know. <laughs> Wait, so you bring up a really good point. Yeah. So the Hebrew version of Matthew has the word inhabitants of Jerusalem right. with him. Right. We could also, so there's two ways to translate this. Uh, all those who are dwellers of Jerusalem with him, mm -hmm. all those who are dwellers mm -hmm. 
dwellers of Jerusalem with him. Meaning, what's the emphasis here? They're dwelling with him or they're dwelling in Jerusalem? The Greek doesn't have the word dwellers, no. and so it's just all of Jerusalem with him. And that's what my point, I, I know. So I'm, you're saying it's, it's the allies I'm of Herod saying it's, upset. it's the Very people possible. who are dwelling. I'm just reading the Hebrew Gospel of Matthew. It's dwelling with him. With yeah. who? With Herod. That's his power base. Yeah. Of course they're not happy. Right. What about the rest of the people? I'm going to tell you something. Now, I mean, let me ask you this simple question. This is a, this is a, this is a transitional question. Hmm. If you were in the first century, and you heard that a star appeared, people came, and there's, there, 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 there's some understanding of, of this king being born. Am I wrong in, in thinking that you are looking still in the first century for Messiah, for who Messiah oh, is? The ab- so this is the point. They were so looking fervently for the Messiah in the first century that every few years there was someone who made the claim, I'm the Messiah, and, uh, and, and the Jews were persecuted as a result. There's the story in Acts where Paul is arrested and, and the Roman uh, commander, he's like, oh, you're that Egyptian guy, right? The, <laughs> right. right the, you're that Egyptian, right? So there's so many of these right. messianic claimants, right. the Romans can't even keep track of them all. And, 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 so, and so you hear this, you're like, so there's two things you could think. Finally, the true Messiah is born, mm-hmm. right? How do we know? There are these people who've come from, the, even the Gentiles acknowledge him, yeah. right? That could be one way of looking at it. Um, that certainly seems to be what Matthew is getting at, right? right? The, um, from my perspective, it seems that way. The other way of looking at it is, oh, no, not another one of these, mm-hmm. right? Um, and then Gamaliel had a third approach. He's like, let's wait and see, right? <laughs> right. I'm not going to be upset about this. <laughs> right. We'll see if this works. You know, these things have a way of sorting themselves out, right? Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Right. We'll find out in a couple of generations if he was the true Messiah. Right? That's, that's the Gamaliel approach. Yeah. So, so, so I guess the different Jews could have a different approach to this. Keith, we got to talk about verses five and six because that's the messianic prophecy. So we talked in the last um, uh, episode about Isaiah seven fourteen, and I don't even remember if we got to this. But Jews don't acknowledge that as a messianic prophecy. So a lot of times, Jews and Christians, the Christian will say. Jesus fulfilled 350 messianic prophecies. And the Jews are like, well, which ones? And they name off a bunch of prophecies. And the Jews are like, well, those, those aren't even messianic prophecies. That's about something in the life of Solomon. That's something about the life of David. Uh, that's about Israel collectively. Everyone agrees that Micah 5.1, or 5.2, I think, in the English, is a messianic prophecy. It's undisputed. So this is actually the first, think about that. This is the first undisputed messianic prophecy in the New Testament, in the Gospel of Matthew, uh, chapter two, verses five to six. Well, I want you Can to we get, get ready to this for in it. Hebrew Gospel Pearls Plus. Will we have time? Yes, I want you to get ready because, folks, here's what I want you to do. And, and can, Nehemiah, can I please sandwich this uh, again sure. to help people understand? So we've spent approximately an hour plus uh, talking about what we've talked about. We've only scratched the surface, but there is yeah. some excitement. And 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 Nehemia, and I want us to do justice. I don't want to rush. So what we're going to invite people to do is, if you're interested in going further study with us, please come over to Hebrew Gospel Pearls Plus. This week, I think it's at bfainternational.com. But listen, if you weren't last week in 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 episode two at nehemiaswall.com, you missed it. So don't go to three until you go over to Nehemia's Wall and become a support Amen. team member and go through number two. Now, folks, yeah. let me just tell you something. I want to I want to say this, Nehemia. I want to slow down and say this. I think this is a gift because what we just did is we looked at the English, we looked at the Hebrew, we looked at different possibilities for the Hebrew. As a result of the Hebrew, I have a different perspective. You have a different perspective. We read it a certain way. Ultimately, what we want to do is give you the information and let you make your own decision. We're raising up Bereans who can check for themselves to see if this stuff is true. So that's what we're going to do is we're going to actually have Hebrew Gospel Pros Plus for this week. You go to bfainternational.com. Can I explain how it works, Nehemia? Is it okay? Sure. So this is how this actually works at BFA International. We have what's called premium content, which is $9.99 a month. That's our minimum amount that you pay a month. And it gives you access to everything that we have at BFA International, plus some things that are working, that are in the works, that are going to be coming. But at $9.99 a month, you actually become a premium member. Now, this week, you can go to bfainternational.com. You can become a premium member. And I'll tell you what's really exciting, seven days free. You don't like it <laughs> after seven days, no commitment, no resources, etc. So you can actually listen to what happened in episode one and episode three at BFA international.com and becoming a premium member. And I, I want to tell people 
Those that are already premium members, thank you. Those that are considerate, considering, please, um, thank you for that. But I also want to say for those that are out there that say, Keith, it's a terrible time. I absolutely cannot do this. There's no way I can't afford $9.99 a month. You call me directly and we will try to help you to become a premium member because some people are actually giving to for premium memberships for folks who can't wow. uh, afford it. So yes, thank so, you so much yes. for um, for this, Nehemiah. And I, I'm looking forward to people coming over because this prophecy that we're talking about is, 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 this is exciting. exciting. <laughs> this is really so, exciting. So uh, this week it's over at bfainternational.com, but last week's and next uh, next week's are going to be over at nehemiaswall.com. And the way it works on my website is people who support my ministry, they get access to what I call the support team studies, uh, which will include the the um, some of the... Uh, the Hebrew Gospel Pearls Plus. Um, there we ask that it be a matter of prayer how much you want to give. And look, we get people who write to us and say, you know, I'm on a fixed income. I can't afford anything. And we say, well, will you pray for us? Yes. And if they say, yeah, we'll pray for you, we'll say, okay, we call you a prayer supporter. Amen. Um, we're, we don't want to deny people the information if Amen. they can't afford it. Amen. Uh, at the same time, we have bills to pay. And we want to also, I mean, honestly, give a thank you to those who do support the ministry. Thank and that's you. kind of what this is for us. Yes. Thank you. So we can pray. Um, yeah. Thank you. Yes, uh, let's this end is in prayer. Exciting. Yehovah Avinu Shabbat Shemayim, Yehovah our Father in heaven. Yehovah, the one who controls the heavens, who puts stars in the heaven and the sun and the moon and uses them for signs. Yehovah, I want to thank you for making this possible. Without you, this would not be possible. Without you putting in the hearts of many of the support people, this would not be possible. Without you giving the strength and the wisdom. And the resources, this would not be possible. Yehovah, you are the star of this show. Hmm. Yehovah, thank you for what you've done. And may you continue to guide us and give us the strength so we can complete the task as my cousin did over 150 years ago. We will continue that mission of, of sharing this information based on the Hebrew history, language, and context. Amen. Father, thank you so much for the people that are listening. I pray that you would continually open eyes, open ears, soften hearts. Father, give them inspiration. Father, I believe there are people that are listening that are going to help us even go deeper uh, with the information that you've provided through the Hebrew Gospel um, Project, really, that you really inspired Nehemiah for years. He's gathered these manuscripts, and now to be able to look at them is just an amazing gift, and I want to thank you for that. We ask your blessing. We thank you for your goodness and your grace, and we lift this entire project up to you and pray that you would be glorified in your name. Amen. Amen. You have been listening to Hebrew Gospel Pearls with Nehemia Gordon and Keith Johnson. For a more in-depth study, check out Hebrew Gospel Pearls Plus at NehemiasWall.com and BFAInternational.com. Thank you for your support.